Let's see. There we go. I think we're ready to jump in. Ready? <laughs> and we've got some others coming in. That, that will be perfectly fine. Maybe we're not ready. <laughs> I got to meet this guy, you know. <laughs> I love St. Augustine. I hope to plant some this spring, like put down the sod. I grew up with St. Augustine. And now everything over in Alabama is like Bermuda. I'm like, I need some St. Augustine. Huh? He's right. It's thick and... You can walk on it barefooted. Hey, welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Cam, and to the elders. And, and uh, the elders desire to be a support, a strength to marriage and families. I told Cam, if it's okay, I'll just do my own introduction, all right? Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, this Frank and Ernest cartoon actually tells you most about my credentials, okay? Uh, I believe you can learn from a lot of people's mistakes and not make enough to train everybody here. Hey, the truth of the matter is, I think I could be a better husband if I had it do over again. I think I could be a better parent if I had parenting to do over again. And so my prayer for you, this congregation, and the time we will spend together has been that you will be strengthened in my weaknesses. That much of what we talk about over the next few days will be my life experience. And things that I would do differently if I could do it again. And so I'm hoping you do it better than I did it sooner than I did it better. Yeah, I think I'm doing it better. I just hope you do it better sooner than I did it better. Are you with me? Um... It's good to be here. So I grew up on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And I was living in Texas, Abilene, when Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005. So you can imagine, I was anxious to get back home. I had seen some pictures of the devastation. And when I went back home, I promptly drove down to the beachfront and I observed these houses, these homes. And there were a number of houses, at least a few, along the beachfront that were like this house. They had weathered the storm well. And then as I traveled along the beachfront, I came across a number of houses like this one, and you may not be able to tell entirely, but they still had shingles missing, glass was broken, and oftentimes there was carpet out by the curb, still wet carpet to be hauled off. And then this is a picture I actually took on the Pascagoula beachfront where the water from Hurricane Katrina had come through, wiped out the middle of the house, and the roof is literally sitting on the foundation. And the obvious question that comes to mind when you look at this would be, I wonder if they're going to, what do you think? I heard it. I wonder if they're going to rebuild. And in fact, they did not. You can go there today and see a foundation sitting there where they cleared it off. And so as I began to think about these houses, being a student of marriages and families, I started thinking, well, that's metaphorical for our homes, for our marriages and our families. Like there are some couples who their marriage has weathered the storms of life. They've done it well, and we should celebrate them. We should, as a church, we should hold them up. Let's just do that rather quickly. Have we got anybody here that's been married 15 years? Okay, got 10. All right, got anybody that's been married at least 25 years? Yeah. Got anybody that's been married at least 35? Okay, we're getting on up there. 45? Listen to me. 
God rejoices in the couple who can make a holy life together. Amen? And we need to celebrate those who have weathered the storms of life well. And then oftentimes in an audience of any given size, there are those marriages that are like the house that needs some maintenance. You know what I mean? It's like structurally it's sound, it's stable. Nobody's going anywhere, right? We're committed to each other, but truth be known, if I were to peek through your window, some of you aren't where you'd like to be. You know, we're just not as close as I would think we should be. Or perhaps we just have more conflict than I think we should have. You with me? We, we, hey, we're committed to each other, but yeah, we could maybe use some remodeling. And then at times in an audience, there might be uh, some couples whose marriage has been shaken to the very foundation. And perhaps you have considerable doubt whether we can make this work. You with me? Whether we can rebuild. I hope you will be encouraged by Scripture. Look at Ezra 9, 8 through 9. And now, for a little while, and now, for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival. Yet our God did not forsake us, but he extended mercy to us to revive us, to repair the house of God, to rebuild. Now, you and I know that he's talking about the children of Israel. But I'm here to say to you that is the people of Israel not only needed to rebuild their city, they not only needed to rebuild their temple, they needed to rebuild their lives and their community as God's holy people. And I would suggest to you that remodeling a marriage or rebuilding a marriage begins with renewing our commitment to be God's holy people. You with me? Our God is a God of renewal. Our God is a God of transformation. And though your marriage may only be a remnant of what it was, God can give light unto our eyes and grant you new life. And I would suggest to you that there are perhaps some of us in our lives who have been at all three of these places in our marriages. Amen? Yeah, for some of us. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Look at uh, Ephesians here, 6, 10 through 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Look, I'm here to tell you, you know it. Marriage and family life is a place of spiritual warfare. You don't get married and the devil leaves you alone. You don't bring children into this world and the devil leaves them an alone. I would suggest to you that we are in a raging battle for the hearts and minds and the very souls of our children that begins at the cradle and should never end this side of the grave. You know what I mean? As long as I live, I'll be doing battle for the heart, mind, and soul of my children and my grandchildren, and I'd always also suggest this to you, we're in a raging battle for the sancti sanctity of our marriages that begins at the altar and should never end this side of eternity. The devil is scheming, and he will drive a wedge between the two of us if we are not equipped for battle. You with me? That's where we're going. The devil has a rather simple strategy. It's not hard to understand, but it's highly effective. To effectively alienate and sever a husband's relationship with his wife, to effectively alienate and sever a father's relationship with his children, and in the resulting turmoil to undermine the faith of everyone involved. Look, it's a rather simple strategy. That is not complicated by any means, but it's highly effective. 
Neil Warren said, there's nothing you will ever do to build a strong marriage that's more important than the choice you made. Isn't that true? In other words, if you make the wrong choice, it just might not get much better than this. So I have a curiosity about people's choices, being a student of marriages and families. I'm curious. If, if you knew my lovely wife, Wanda, Cam and Joan know my lovely wife, Wanda, you would say, I wonder how Wanda chose a crustacean like Steve. You know what I mean? Yeah, I have a real curiosity about how people choose one another. But you know, I also have a curiosity about how couples grow apart over time. Like I'm, I'm curious how couples will pledge their love to one another, their devotion to one another, and then over time they will grow apart, and in seven years, ten years, they don't even like each other anymore. In other words, I have a curiosity about how a marriage dies. Does that make sense to you? Are you curious? How many of you have witnessed it? Like 10 years and they go their separate ways. 20 years. I've had students raise their hand and say, my grandparents married 45 years. Go their separate ways. So I have a curiosity about how couples grow apart over time. So here's what I'm going to do with you, try to do with you today as our best our time commits. I want us to look at six factors that contribute to couples growing apart over time. And we're going to try to do four of those before lunch, two of them as best we can during, during our class time, and then two of them during our worship time. The familiarity factor, it's not new anymore. The fatigue factor, it's not pressing anymore. The flaw factor, it's not easy. The change factor, that's just the way I am. The control factor, love is diminished. And the faith factor, it's not enough. Today we'll be looking at these six factors. Now here's what I'd say to you. The devil is scheming and he's working in every one of those six to lead you apart over time, to have you grow distant from one another over time. In fact, I like this quote by Bill Crawford, unless you grow and change together, you will change and grow apart. Isn't that true? I think so. Listen to me. There's one thing I know about you individually and collectively as a couple, and that is your influence will not be neutral. You have it within you to be an incredible influence for good and righteousness in the life of your spouse and your family, or you have it in you to do unspeakable harm. But I'm confident your influence will not be neutral. Amen? There's a deeper question that needs to be addressed beyond how can we improve our marriage. What if God didn't design marriage to be easier? What if God had an end in mind that went beyond our happiness, our comfort? What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? I want to be clear to you. I believe if you build a sacred marriage, you'll find happiness and life satisfaction. But I also would suggest to you that God is far more concerned about your holiness than your happiness. And one of the reasons we have so many troubled marriages today is because we're chasing the wrong goal. We're pursuing happiness more than holiness. And so when I suggest to you that we will look at a blueprint for growing together, what I'm talking about is we will look at a blueprint for making a holy life together, for helping one another get to heaven, so to speak. Does that make sense, I hope? That's where we're going. Gary Thomas defines a sacred marriage. A sacred marriage equips you to love your God more, helps you reflect the character of his son more precisely, and then I added, and demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit in your life. 
Is that worth saying again, I hope? A sacred marriage equips you to love your God more, helps you reflect the character of his son more precisely, and demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit in your life. So just like the celibate would use abstinence and the religious hermit would use isolation, I suggest to you that we can use marriage for the same purpose, to grow in our service, obedience, character, and pursuit of God. So I'm going to give you a symbol, and I want you to be reminded every time you see it what I have in mind. And this symbol, you notice, has a heart. That's your love for God. It has a cross. That's your desire to reflect the character of his son more precisely. And it's got a dove that is the fruit of the spirit in your life. That's what I'm talking about when you see that sign. I'm talking about qualities that are part of your DNA. Let me explain the metaphor with you just a bit. When I told my son, I'm like, hey, Alan, I'm going to kind of frame my presentation a little differently. I'm going to talk about the DNA of a sacred marriage. He says, well, Dad, it's not in my DNA to possess and per perfect the qualities of a sacred marriage. Like, your, your title doesn't work. It's not in my DNA. That's what he said to me, and he's exactly right. So listen carefully. He's right in this sense. It is not in your DNA as a natural man, natural woman. What I'm talking about is your spiritual DNA. The qualities, I'm talking about knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors that you will pursue, possess, and perfect in your life because you are a spiritual man or woman. It's not the DNA of the natural man. It's the DNA of the spiritual man. You with me? You see where we're going, I hope? I hope? Well, let's give it a try, and you can tell me if it works or not. All right, number one, the familiarity factor. It's not new anymore. I'm going to see if I can get you involved in just, uh, just a little bit here. It's not new anymore. Uh, anybody in here ever bought a new car? like brand spanking new, okay? Uh, how many of you have adopted rules for taking care of your new car? Give me some of your rules. No eating in our car. Some people even adopt no eating or drinking in our car, don't they, right? Some other rules for taking care of your new car. Clean your feet off. Absolutely no smoking. Don't even think about it. And... Oh, yes, I love it. I love it. It's like, hey, you don't pull right up in front of Dollar General and go walking in if, unless you want the door dings, right? You park way out. In fact, it's kind of, I told Cam, it's kind of unusual. My wife and I in the last month bought a new car. And we have adopted what we call a successful park. Here's a successful park. If we park somewhere and we go in, we park way out, we walk into Walmart, and we come out, and nobody has parked on either side of us, that's a successful park. We, did, we chose well. And we'll park right next to a curb, because at least that cuts the odds in half, right? How about washing it every week? You ever known anybody to wash their car every week? Huh? I've known people. Buy the unlimited car wash down at the, you know, Atlanta Highway. Take it every week. Get it washed. Don't we? Now watch. Why do we do that? It's a new car. It has great value to us. And we adopt certain rules for taking care of it because it has great value to us, right? How many of you drive a tw 10, 12-year-old car? Got that? I'll do that. I got one of those, you know? You know what I like about a 10, 12-year-old car? I don't wash it every week. How about this? How many of you uh, adopt the rule that you can't eat or drink in your 12-year-old car? Anybody? Yeah, there's normally one in every crowd, you know, all right? <laughs> Isn't it true? How many of you are still parking way out with your 12-year-old car and walking all the way in? Yeah, you don't, do you? You drive right on up there. You've already accumulated some dings, and hey, what's one more going to hurt? Isn't that true? Now watch this. Watch this. 
What's the difference? Well, there it is. It's the familiarity factor. It's not new anymore. Listen to this. The delightful becomes ordinary. The enchanting becomes routine. That's worth saying again. The delightful becomes ordinary. The enchanting becomes routine. Why? Because of the familiarity factor. It's not new anymore. It's the way of life. That, hey, it doesn't feel the same. I don't care if we're talking new cars, your best suit, or guess what? Marriage. Your marriage is going to come face to face with the familiarity factor. It's not new anymore. The delightful becomes ordinary. The enchanting becomes routine. Yeah, I think you know what I mean. Here's the problem with the familiarity factor. When it no longer feels the same, we begin to treat them differently. Isn't that what we did with the cars? It no longer felt the same. We began to treat them differently. We get lazy. We start breaking the rules. Look, we not only, we not only neglect the rules, we literally break the rules of taking care of one another in a way that says you have great value to me. That's the problem with the familiarity factor is we get too comfortable. We get too, we take them for granted and we begin to treat them differently. You know exactly what I mean, don't you? Let me give you, see if I can give you a real life example. Or any of you like me, I'll try to take off my mask with you. Or any of you like me, you, uh, on the job, during the day, all during the day, you treat people with, with respect. You're kind of careful what you say to other people. You even bite your tongue sometimes. You even show restraint in order to be respectful of your coworkers. Have any of you done like me? You're respectful to your coworkers all day, and then you go home, and you're short with your wife. You're direct. You have very little patience. You say whatever comes to mind with very little restraint. You with me? It's the familiarity factor. It's not new anymore. You don't withhold the little criticisms. You know what I'm talking about. Things that you would not have done when you were trying to win their love. Here's what research tells us. Research will tell us that just about any couple that separates, divorces, goes their separate way, you go up and do a little research. They will tell you, my spouse doesn't respect me. My spouse doesn't value my opinion. My spouse second guesses all my decisions. They don't respect me. Um, I should, uh, should have shared the home improvement. You know Tim the tool man. They had an episode where where Jill was saying, hey, you know, yesterday we didn't even kiss hello or goodbye. And he says, you were all sweaty. And she, she says, no, really. I mean, I've been thinking about how we've been relating yes lately it's like we're we're growing apart and he says oh no our relationship is like any couple who has been married this long it's comfortable it's like an old pair of shoes and she's like that's what our marriage has become is like an old pair of shoes and he, he he says well not worn out it's stretched out they're broken in he says comfortable lasts forever what's wrong with that and jill thinks a moment and looks at him and says everything is wrong with that so our first quality of our spiritual dna is to show honor and respect oh in scripture first peter 3 7 watch this guys you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way and show her honor as a fellow heir of grace, the grace of life. And then, guess what? Oh, I, there it is. 
1 Peter 3, 7. And guess what? He says something very similar to that to the women over in Ephesians 5, 33. Let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Oh, isn't it interesting that maybe that's where we begin? Perhaps it's because love grows out of an attitude of honor. Don't tell me you love someone if you cannot hold them in a place of honor and respect. I like this uh, quote here. Never ever speak negative. Okay, let's just go ahead and stop there. I've already broken that part. Uh, I've already messed up the never ever, all right? Never ever speak negatively of your mate. Build them up to anyone who will listen. Praise their good qualities. Never give public voice to your irritation or dissatisfaction. You catch them doing something right, and you praise them, and you honor them. Uh, Listen to me. Men, it's saying this. Your wife's esteem should go up because of her relationship with you. And he's saying a very similar thing to the wives. Hey, to the wives, hey, your husband's sense of admiration should go up because of the way he is esteemed in your eyes and in the eyes of your children. Let me say it again. Men, your wife's countenance, her sense of self should go up because of the way she is valued in your eyes. I think that's what the scripture is saying. Husbands, honor your wives. Wives, show respect to your husband. Do you, do you get the connection? You see, honor and respect are the opposite of taking for granted. Honor and respect are the opposite of becoming too comfortable in the relationship. Listen to this story if you'll permit me by Gary Smalley. He says, recently at a gathering of almost 400 men, all leaders in their churches across the country, I was struck by a thought about honor that came to me right when I was speaking. I was saying that most men get really excited about symbols of accomplishment like golf trophies, tennis medals, diplomas, or mounted fish. How many of you have got something mounted somewhere? Trophy. You come to my office, you got a two bass on one side you got a nine point buck on the other side let me ask you this he, <clears throat> let me ask you this who does that bring honor to attention to me look what i've accomplished look what i've done is the point he's making right spontaneously i mentioned i had recently caught a 27 inch dolly varden trout on a trip to alaska and had just mounted it on my wall and then I said to their laughter this 400 guys right I don't have a big picture of Norma at either my home or work office but I've got trout I've caught mounted at both places and can't you just see these 400 guys just laughing yeah yeah, you've got your trophies but you don't have a as the laughter poured in my words suddenly caught in my throat I had to stop and admit how amazing it was that I had never thought about that contrast before Norma is of much higher value to me than any of the things I might accomplish, catch, or mount. Yet those things were more prominently displayed on my walls. Rest assured that by the time you read this book, two beautifully framed pictures of Norma will be hanging in prominent places at home and at work. Do you get the picture? You go to... The Song of Solomon, and all through the Song of Solomon, this couple is just praising, honoring one another. In chapter 2, verse 2, he says, like a lily among the thorns is my darling. Verse 3, she says, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the men. All through the Song of Solomon, they're holding one another up in honor and respect. So let's see if we can get you involved a little bit here. Top five answers on the board. What can you do this week to honor and show respect to your spouse? Anybody got some favorites? Cook dinner, all right, yes. Hey, let me give you some relief maybe, right? Yes, absolutely. Anybody else? Anybody else? Clean the kitchen is a way. Yes, absolutely. Help. Tell, oh, tell them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't help but think like, hey, you know when you say the prayer at lunch, 
We normally give thanks for the food. Guys, do you do you normally give thanks for the one that oft, most often prepared it? Honor her for that. Yes, I go here, then here. Yes, I was told we've got some car enthusiasts, and so I'm very open to car metaphors. So yes, it's like, hey, polish it. <laughs> little love note goes a long way to saying, hey, you are of great value to me. Hey, maybe, hey, praising, complimenting, everybody thrives on appreciation, don't we? We all thrive on appreciation. Those are words of honor. Hey, I appreciate when you blank. How about this one? Top five answers on the board. Things a husband or wife does not does to dishonor or disrespect their spouse. Ooh. Um, how about I take a lead on this one? Would that be okay? For time's sake. Only for time's sake. All right. Let me take a lead on this one. Um, let's see. A few. I remember when I was first married. I like to cut up, have a little fun, right? I can distinctly remember leaving a gathering of church peoples and such, and my wife goes, boof. You know what boof is? That's code for don't do that again. <laughs> and I'm like, what did I do? And she said, you made me the butt of the joke. I'm like, oh, I was just, we got any people with a good sense of humor in here? I hope we do. I hope you laugh a lot. But I don't know about you, but I kind of learned that my wife didn't want to be the butt of my joke. If you want to be funny, you find plenty of things to laugh about, but you leave your spouse out of it. That is a slippery slope. There might be a few exceptions to that, but not very many, I would suggest. How about this one? Questioning my decisions unnecessarily. To me, that one's huge. You're driving down the road. My wife, and she, by the way, I have a lovely wife. I have a good marriage. Sometimes I have a great marriage. Sometimes I have a good marriage. Is that right? Okay. It's not constant. It's like I have a wonderful wife. And we're driving down the road. And Wanda's like, didn't you want to return here? I didn't say it this way, but I was very tempted to say, well, if I wanted to return there, I would have turned there. But I, I didn't say that. She says, didn't you want to turn there? And I'm like, no, I'd like to go this way. She says, well, that way's further. I'm like, well, I don't know if it's further, but I like to go this way. Well, you're going to cause us to be late. Well, I, I don't think I'll cause us to be late, but I, I like to go this Do you all have conversations that go like that? It's like, what didn't let me drive? <laughs> hey, I don't know if I know you well enough to give this example, but I'm going to take a little risk here. For three years in a row, at least, my wife and I had this conversation. Wanda. I need some new underwear. Wanda, you just bought underwear. Wanda, uh, Steve, no, I, I don't think I did. It seems like you just bought underwear. I, I don't think I did. Wanda, I don't know. I don't mark the calendar. I'm just telling you that I need new underwear. Well, it seems like you buy a lot of underwear. I, I say, I don't know. I think I buy it about once a year. And... And she's like, well, you buy more underwear than me. And I'm like, well, I don't know, Wanda. Maybe it's because mine are white. I don't know. <laughs> and we had that conversation, listen to me, three years in a row. And I finally looked at my wife and I said, look, don't you ever say a thing to me again about me buying underwear. I will pay for it out of my blow fund. <laughs> you with me? Do y'all, am I the only, or we don't, we need help, I guess. I don't know. But look, I hope we get to do a Wednesday night class on communication and conflict. And if you come to that class, I will, I will take you into the deeper waters of understanding why my wife would even make a statement like that. She's a good, good person. But there's, there's deeper waters that are beneath those. We're, we're going through, we're going through uh, pieology with the grandchildren. And she looks back at me. I, I've already told you I've got a wonderful wife, right? Cam and Joan know it. All right, trust me. But my lovely wife looks back at me and she says, you're the only one that got something to drink. See, all of them got water. Steve comes along and she looks back and says, you got Diet Coke. You're the only one that got something to drink. And I'm like, 
I'm 60 some odd years old. I'm gainfully employed and I will buy a Diet Coke if I want a Diet Coke. Are you with me? Are we the only ones that... And understanding her behaviors like that are deeper waters. She's not an insensitive person. There's something else that's beneath those kinds of comments. And in our Wednesday night class that I hope we'll do together with some of you, we'll get in, tread into some deeper waters. Are you with me? Making me, the b criticizing the little things I do, fault finding. Okay, I got to speed up. Where's, what's my time? All right. Oh, yeah, I'm in trouble. All right, here we go. Honor and respect, courtship, emotional bonding. Look, I would suggest to you that many marriages suffer from RDS, Romance Deficiency Syndrome. It's like, hey, if there was more courtship in marriage, there would be fewer marriages in court. In other words, um, there's oftentimes too much passion before marriage and way too little passion after marriage. A man will dump a truckload of chocolates in the driveway when he's trying to win her love, and then she won't send, see a candy bar for, you know, the story, right? Look at this. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. May you ever be captivated by her love. May you rejoice in the husband of your youth. May you ever be captivated by his love. What that is saying to me is not only am I talking about passion, I'm talking about an emotional bond. How many of you would know exactly what I'm talking about if I said to you, you should never let your children get too far from you emotionally? You'd know exactly what I meant by that, wouldn't you? Well, let me say it in, in terms of marriage. You should never let your spouse get too far from you emotionally. You should continue to pursue an emotional bond with him or her. One wife said, I haven't the slightest idea what my husband is thinking about most of the time. He doesn't talk to me, and he can get as cold as stone when the pressure is on. I want to rap on his heart and cry out, hello, is anybody home? And I would suggest to you there is no woman who's more alone than she whose husband will not share his heart with her. David May says, hey, I'm not just talking passion. I'm not just talking about emotional bonding experiences. I'm also talking affection. David May says affection is the single most important ingredient that is blended throughout the many changes produced by time and circumstance. It is the common bond that gives heart and strength to shared life. Oh, isn't that good? He says affection is the single most important ingredient. Do you have it in you to be affectionate? You're like, hey, I'm a welder. And I'm like, well, I was a welder too when I was 19, 20 years old. I think I know what you mean. But I'm, I will say this to you. I don't care if you are a welder. You best get you some affection because she normally wants and needs it. I'm talking affection. Affectionate touch. Affectionate words. It's like, when was the last time during communion you reached over and took her hand just to communicate we're in this spiritual life together. I want to be close to you. Oh, affectionate words, affectionate touch. Rate, rate on a scale of one, barely has a pulse to ten, how affectionate you are towards your spouse, how affectionate they are to you. You with me? I've got to hurry. Oh, how about this one? Caring deeds. Caring deeds. I'm going to get you involved here, all right? Caring deeds. Have you ever noticed how you will go out of your way to help a friend or do anything asked of you by your children or grandchildren? And then act irritated and inconvenienced when your spouse makes a simple request. Would you change this light bulb? And you act like you're being put out. Like you're being intimate. You'll do most anything for a friend or an extended family member. And then complain when your spouse asks you to do something that's going to take up your time. Am I the only one that does this sort of thing? Or it's, it's and I would suggest to you, because of the familiarity factor, we may begin to neglect 
and even resent those small, small caring deeds that communicate that you are of great value to me. Look at Philippians 2, 3 through 4 together as we try to hurry. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. conceit. Listen, selfishness is still the number one enemy of marriage. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Uh, could I change that and suggest to you that if this scripture, what this scripture is saying, should begin in your home first and foremost? Could I change it just a little bit? Rather, in humility, value your husband above yourself. In humility, value your wife above yourself. Not looking to your own cares and interests, but each of you to the cares and interests of the other. Would that work for our marriages? So let me see if I can get you involved here a little bit. Uh, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. Uh, you want to, you want a way, you want to, let me say it right. You want a highly effective way of avoiding growing part, apart over time as a couple? Then see if you can outserve one another in each other's lives. How can I serve you? So let's see. Let me get you involved here. I feel cared for when you blank. I need some quickly. I know my time's up, but they told me I could cheat a little bit, so I probably will. I feel cared for when fill in the blank. When you spend time with me. Hey, could I set an example? My wife would say, I feel cared for when Steve puts gas in my car. You know, her car gets down in the red zone, down there by the E, and Steve is paying attention, and I drive it, and I notice it, and I know she doesn't like to put gas in her car, and before she gets up, I go out there, and I drive down the road, I fill it up, put it back in the garage, I go off to work, and she goes out there and cranks it up, and guess what that needle does? Zoom. Goes way over here to the F. And she says, ah, he's paying attention. I feel cared for when Steve puts gas in my car. I feel cared for when you, you make time in your schedule for me. I feel cared for when. Somebody give me some. Don't worry me. You're going to get me worried if you can't fill in the blank. I feel cared for when, when you unload the dishwasher. Absolutely. I feel cared for when you mop the, f what a guy. What, what a guy, Cam. I feel cared for when you mop the floor. I feel cared for, anybody? Hey, when you take the kids and just let me go. I feel cared for when you bring me a glass of tea. I feel cared for when you walk outside and I'm painting and you're like, oh, that looks so good. Thank you. Here's some tea. Isn't it true? You sure tell so. Now watch this. I know I need to hurry. What do all those things that you just said? And if we had time, I'd go all around the room. And you know what they all have in common? Every one of them. Every one of them are small, repetitive behavior. Nobody said, I feel cared for when you take me to Cancun. And certainly nobody said, hey, I feel cared for when you take me to Disney World these days. Right, huh? I feel care. It's the smart watch. Here's what makes that so important. Emotional bonding comes in the hundreds of little things we do for another person. That's what, look, your marriage is in trouble when you stop doing the little things that say, I care about you, I value you. Look at this. The greatest manifestations of love are simple acts of kindness. Small deeds done are better than great deeds planned. Hey, can I run over a few minutes to give you the fatigue factor? It won't take as long as the other, but if you'll permit me. You can be mad. I mean, I'm flying out on Wednesday, so, it, you know. what? Let me take a few minutes with the fatigue factor. It's not pressing anymore. How many of you keep to-do lists? To-do listers? I keep to-do lists. When I was 19 years old, at the top of my to-do list was when, W-I-N, Wanda's love. Watch this. I was at my highest energy level in terms of body. I was six foot one, 125 pounds, and I was physically fit. I was at my highest energy level in terms of body, and I was at my lowest responsibility level in terms of lifestyle. 
I lived at home, had a lot of time on my hands outside of work. I put a lot of time and energy into winning Wanda's love. I hadn't read any books, but somehow I quickly figured out that conversation was part of winning Wanda's love. So she would call in the evenings, and I'm like, oh, I, got that time. I don't particularly like to talk on the phone, but I knew if I was going to win her love. And so here's what I do. Don't tell her, Cam, when y'all see her. During the day, I would write things on my hand. Bank robbery, Gulfport, Mississippi. Church fire, Mobile, Alabama. And that evening, she'd call. I'm like, hey, did you hear about that bank robbery over in Gulfport? I was up on current events, man. I was working at it. It was pressing, Right? And, hey, that, that church, it burned. You didn't see that on the news. You knew what church burned. Which, oh, I'll talk about this. I, somehow I knew conversation was winning Wanda's love. Do you get the picture? I put a lot of time and energy into winning her love. Here's the problem with the fatigue factor. Is that as time goes on, we begin to go out, invest ourselves more and more in other things, don't we? We invest ourselves in moving up the corporate ladder. We invest ourselves in children. We invest more and more of ourselves in church. We invest more and more of ourselves into developing uh, property. We invest more and more of ourselves of creating a portfolio. You with me? And at the end of the day, I get home, and you know what? There's not a whole lot left over. I'm like, hey, just pass the remote. Could we just remote? At one, at one time, you're like, just let me read the paper. You, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so I'm going to suggest to you that one of the qualities you need to seek is a balanced lifestyle. A balanced lifestyle. For the sake of your marriage and family, you must pursue a balanced lifestyle. And I would suggest to you that Christians should be among the hardest working people on this planet. I really believe that. At one time, I was a CPA in a previous life, and I worked a lot. I've always worked positions where I worked a lot. My father was an alcoholic, but the one thing that we found that we could admire about him, we put it on his epitaph. In his own way, he taught us to fear God and to work hard. For this we honor him, his five sons. And you ask anybody that knows the five wages, boys, and they are known for what? They're known for working. I think Christians should be some. And I used to at one time beat up on myself for working so much, and then I started studying Genesis, and it said God created this garden, placed man in the garden, and told him to do what? Tend to it. Work it. And I spend a whole lot of my time tending to things and working things. And um, Ecclesiastes here, I have noticed one thing at least that is good. It is good for people to eat, drink, and enjoy their work under the sun during the short life God has given them and to accept their lot in life. And it is a good thing to receive wealth from God and good health to enjoy it, to enjoy your work and accept it, your lot in life. This is indeed, watch this, a gift from God. God keeps us, keeps such people so busy enjoying life that they take no time to brood over the past. Hey, let me try to be brief here. As much as I believe in leading a balanced lifestyle, I have always found it elusive. I preach it, I teach it, and it's like somebody dropping a feather from a balcony and saying, Steve, catch it. Catch it. I believe in it if, I could ju if you could just show me how to get my arms around it. A balanced lifestyle. You with me? And if I had it to do, do over again, listen to me. If I had it to do over again, I was a managing partner of a CPA firm one time. If I had it all to do over again, I would, have never, I would never become a partner. I would just stay a well-paid supervisor, and I would go home at 5 o'clock. And if I had it to do over again, I would work less and play more, and my children would play less and work more. Do you know what I'm talking about? They would. I'd work less and play more. My children would play less and work more. Our society has become schizophrenic. We prize people who want balance in their lives, but reward those who work themselves to death. Or will you give me time for the Mexican fishermen? I'll read fast if you'll tolerate. I know, yeah, we're close. An American businessman was at a pier in a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took to catch them. The Mexican replied, only a little while. 
The American then asked, why didn't he stay out longer, catch more fish? The Mexican said he had enough to support his family's immediate needs. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? The Mexi Mexican replied, I sleep late, fish a little, play with my wife, children, take a siesta with my wife, Maria, stroll into the village each evening where I play the guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life, senor. The American scoffed, say, I have an MBA from Harvard. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds buy a bigger boat. With the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually, you'd have a fleet of fishing boats. Instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you'd sell directly to the processor, opening your own cannery. You would control product processing distribution. You'd need to leave this small coastal fishing village, move to Mexico City to manage your growing empire. The Mexican fisherman asked, but senor, how long will all this take? To which the American replied, 15 to 20 years. But what then, senor? The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company stock to the public and become very rich. You'd make millions, millions, senor, then what? The American said, hey, then you would retire. Move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late. Fish a little, play with your kids, take siesta with your wife, stroll to the village in the evening where you would play your guitar with your amigos. And the moral of that story is this. I'm a believer in American capitalism, but American capitalism is not family friendly. We don't have to look far to see people who have made it up the corporate ladder and they've lost their spouse along the way, they've lost their children along the way. So ask yourselves, ask yourselves, um, how good are you at a balanced lifestyle? So the last one we'll do really quickly here is recreational companions. Look at what scripture says right here. We're going to wrap up. Enjoy life with your wife, with the wife you love all the days of your fleeting life. What's it say? It says enjoy life with your wife. And look at this. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live, that everyone may eat, drink, and find satisfaction in all of his toil. Look, God's for pleasure. He's for pleasure in the right things. Young people, I'm glad you're here. If you don't remember anything else, you remember this. God's for pleasure. He's for pleasure in the right way. God's for fun. He's for fun in the right way. I even tell parents, parenting is teaching your children to find pleasure in the right things. You with me? And I love this. We'll end uh, with this right here. I love that picture. I have decided that your wife really knows that you are devoted to her. When you give her the message in no uncertain way, I cannot think of anyone else I'd rather have fun with than you. Isn't that good? I can't think of anyone at Wanda. I can't think of anyone else I'd rather have fun with than you. That's recreational companionship. That's enjoying life with your wife. We don't have time for it, but if I had time for it, I'd go around the room and say, tell me something that you enjoy doing together, having fun together. My time's up, more so. I'm sorry, but hey, see you again here in a few moments. <coughs>